Thank you, Cynthia. And yes, it really is Boudelier. <laughs> On the 5th of December, 1980, Margaret Rhodes and Diane Barry wrote to Robert Swain, then director of the Agnes Etherington Art Center, with an appeal. Would the Art Center consider the establishment of a home for a permanent collection of fine quilts? As longtime quilters and quilting teachers both had witnessed, quote, a dramatic change of attitude regarding quilting as a true form of art. Often credited with having the most significant impact on this revival is the 1971 exhibition, Abstract Design in American Quilts, which premiered at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. Historical quilts were hung on walls like non-objective paintings. While the exhibition heralded a new way of looking at historical quilts, it also elicited criticisms that continue to this day. Namely, quilts displayed as art were being separated from their cultural context and the women who made them too easily dismissed as happily anonymous. My interest in these debates is a, is a, a curatorial one. With these theoretical concerns still in play, what does one do with a quilt collection when faced with the practical and technical considerations of mounting an exhibition or simply documentation? When the Agnes Etherington Art Center celebrated 30 years of its heritage quilt collection, it was part of another palpable surge of interest in quilts. In 2010 to 2011, there were a number of major historical quilt exhibitions abroad and in Canada that underlined ways of displaying quilts as both aesthetic and cultural objects. The 1971 exhibition at the Whitney was drawn entirely from the collection of, uh, sorry, oh, of um, Jonathan Holstein and Gail Vanderhoofs. Only pieced quilts were chosen because of their strong visual impact. As Holstein wrote in the exhibition catalog, quilt makers did, in effect, paint with fabrics. Each maker had full liberty in terms of colors, arrangements, sizes of the blocks, and her own variations. The affinity with geometrical abstract painting, like op art, hard edge, and color field was explicit. The exhibition was dedicated to the American abstract artist Barnett Newman. Visuality was the only informing factor, regardless of craftsmanship, age, condition, area, or history. Holstein had been criticized. I'll put on a quilt so you can look at that instead of the Newman. <laughs> Holstein had been criticized for evaluating quilts on only the narrowest of visual criteria and for dismissing applique quilts altogether. Art historian Patricia Minardi was the first one to respond to the exhibition from a feminist perspective. She wrote, although pieced quilts are primarily geometric in design and as such should be considered only in formalist terms, that would only be half the story. The Whitney Show did not expand the definition of art according to her. Instead, it rubber-stamped already established white male art styles. Because, she said, our female ancestors' pieced quilts bear a superficial resemblance to the work of contemporary formalist artists, such as Stella, Noland, and Newman, modern male curators and critics are now capable of seeing the art in them. Most recently, Karen Peterson takes the Whitney exhibition to task and extends Minardi's argument in a 2011 essay. She writes, the Whitney exhibition can be understood to offer an assimilationist rather than a transformative strategy. Quilts would be valued in the contemporary art world only to the extent that they looked like other things on display in the institutions of that art world. Peterson also argues that even in today's culture, the museum still serves the function of legitimization 
and its main tools for achieving it still reside in the same resources, the enactment of the modern eye in display and of modernist criteria of evaluation in discourse. As a curator at a public art gallery that is in the rather unique position of having a quilt collection, I am keenly interested in the criteria of evaluation. But certain fundamental, fundamental issues of value are a given, whether or not to collect quilts as art, even whether quilts are art, these questions have already been answered for me. Fortunately, the quilt collection that I now oversee has, from its very foundations, straddled the formalist ambitions of the Whitney exhibition and the transformative intentions of its critics. When Margaret Rhodes and Diane Barry approached the Art Centre to found a quilt collection, they felt that the time was critical. Because of the 1970s quilts as art craze, many valuable regional and historical quilts were either leaving the area in the hands of enthusiastic collectors or disintegrating in inadequate storage. But also because of the craze, they felt confirmed in their perception of quilts as art and in approaching an art gallery to collect them. Fellow Kingston Heirloom Quilters member Francis Crandall was willing to donate funds for the purchase of quilts if the Art Center was willing to take them on. And the following year, the Heritage Quilt Collection was born. And here I have an image, of course, of Rhodes and Barry with my predecessor, the curator, Dorothy Farr. By 1984, 17 quilts in total have been purchased. These were supplemented by donations as owners, often local descendants of, quilts, of the quilts makers, heard about and were encouraged by the project. In part, because quilters formed the collection, attention was paid to craftsmanship, age, condition, area, and history, those factors expressly ignored by Holstein, as well as visual qualities. Criticism of the 1971 Whitney exhibition has focused not only on the selective content, but also the method of installation. Some have seen this form of installation perpetuated in more recent exhibitions, such as the 2003 The Quilts of G's Band, also at the Whitney, which featured African-American quilts from Alabama. Karen Peterson argues that the G's Bend exhibition paralleled the 1971 exhibition, quote, in the sense that the museum's white walls still frame the quilts which are hung against them with sufficient space for viewers to experience them as they would paintings, from afar, aloof, and with little contextual interference. She also pointed out that the G's Band catalog further facilitates what she calls the modern eye in their display of quilts on glossy white pages. Peterson ends with a dilemma. Have the museum's implicit practices shaped the way we see to such an extent that alternative ways of seeing are not even possible? The modern eye as a mechanism of distinction has yet to be replaced in contemporary culture by another eye that might be more pluralistic, open, and flexible with regard to the diverse and rich contexts from which objects arise. And here we reach a certain paralysis in critical inquiry. We are given examples of exhibitions that are inadequate, but we are not given any possible solutions. How much contextual interference is enough? How much is even possible? Are all strategies attributed to the modernist eye really all that bad? <laughs> At the same time, Janet Catherine Burlow observed in 2003 that since Jonathan Holstein first called attention to it, 
Art historical inquiry has turned away from the aesthetic and formal issues in the last 20 years, focusing instead on social and epistemological questions. In 2011, the Agnes Etherington Art Centre mounted an exhibition in part to mark the 30th anniversary of the quilt collection. While organizing this exhibition, I realized that there were quite a number of quilt exhibitions occurring at other institutions in Canada and abroad, which presented a variety of creative approaches to the display of quilts today. I'm just going to run through some of these exhibitions, but this first one that I mentioned, I'd, sorry, I don't have any images. <laughs> in fall 2009, the Textile Museum of Canada opened Kaleidoscope, antique quilts from the collection of Carol and Howard to Tannenbaum. As the introductory panel pointed out, the Tannenbaums collected these quilts because of how they looked. They collected them because they looked like art. Not limited to pieced quilts, however, the exhibition was organized according to themes of construction and visual effect, such as geometry, the difference between figure and ground, patterns, etc. There were no tombstone labels, wall labels. Instead, <laughs> individual quilts were numbered and further context was provided on laminated handheld cards available in each space. With over 40 quilts, the overall effect was variety and richness. The absence of labels on the walls allowed more quilts to be exhibited. The following February 2010, during Black History Month, the exhibition Stitching Community, African Canadian Quilts from Southern Ontario opened at the Royal Ontario Museum. By contrast to Kaleidoscope, this exhibition featured less than 10 quilts, but the focus was more specific, spanning 1848 to 1976. The exhibition primarily explored the quilting traditions of the African Canadian community in North Buxton, Ontario. The four main sections underlined themes of community. The exhibition also included a video component and a display case with tools of the trade and cloth dolls underlining the fact that many African Canadian quilters at that time had been employed as seamstresses during and after enslavement in the United States. In 2010-2011, the American Folk Art Museum also mounted no less than three quilt exhibitions to mark what they called the Year of the Quilt celebrating, as they said in their publicity, the creative contributions of three centuries of talented women. Quilts, masterworks from the American Folk Art Museum, highlighted new acquisitions and cornerstones of the collection. Superstars at their Lincoln Square branch focused on the one motif. <clears throat> An infinite ver variety Three centuries of red and white quilts at the Park Avenue Armory featured quilts from the private collection of Joanna S. Rose. Infinite, I didn't see infinite variety. It's the one among those I'm going to discuss that I was not able to see. It was on display for only six days, but it was the largest exhibition of quilts ever held in New York City. 651 red and white quilts were installed in the armory's 55,000 square foot drill hall. As curator Elizabeth Warren described, quote, it's really more of a happening than a traditional museum exhibition. <laughs> Consider it like Christo's Gates in Central Park, but taken indoors, she said. Not one quilt was installed on a wall. <laughs> The exhibition was pure spectacle. The first exhibition, the final exhibition, sorry, of 2010-2011 uh, that I want to highlight was Quilts 1700 to 2010 at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. 
curated by Sue Pritchard. This was the V&A's first major exhibition of British quilts, and it brought out many from their own extensive collection, paired with key loans and contemporary quilt commissions. At the entrance of the show and the beginning of the first theme, the domestic landscape, patchwork bed hangings from 1730, from around 1730, were installed on a bed-like form. The space was divided into room-like display areas, but these spaces did not at the same time attempt to completely reconstruct domestic interiors, thereby allowing for the focus to be on the artistry of the quilts. In the installation of a mid-18th century whole cloth bed cover and single curtain, for example, raking horst, oh, I loved this installation, raking historical, uh, <laughs> raking horizontal light highlighted the virtuosity of stitching, which is often difficult to see in whole cloth quilts. As many of you probably know, photographing them is a nightmare. But you can see that line of lights uh, installed inside the wall to um, run across the surface of the quilt. In the section entitled Private Thoughts, Political Debates, a patchwork coverlet of around 1829 attributed to Elizabeth Chapman was installed not on but inside a museum wall with plexiglass windows to allow visitors to view the backing papers of this unfinished piece. So you would cut your patterns out for a quilt and you'd fold the cloth over this piece of paper and then you would sew all these together to make your, your patchwork quilt. quilt. <clears throat> they would use any paper that was available to make these little patterns. You can barely, oh, in this very blurry photo, you can barely see them pe peeking out behind. Um, the papers range from ledger books, children's copy books, advertisements, newspapers, and receipts. In the section Making a Living, which explored commercial quilting at the start of the 20th century, some quilts were installed on trestled platforms that suggested work tables. Here I have described, without even mentioning the didactics, just a few of the physical features in the V&A exhibition that highlighted the construction, aesthetics, and social practice of quilts. The V&A exhibition incorporated a number of innovative installations that addressed the question of whether alternative framings of quilts are even available, as raised by Peterson. As you can see in this installation shot, however, Quilts were also hung on walls as a viable way to view a quilt closely. Speaking practically, quilts require a great deal of museum real estate, not to mention the conservation issues. Installing them on walls is an economical way to show more of them. Increasingly, however, institutions, including my own, have also been selectively displaying quilts on beds or bed-like pla bed -like platforms to convey how historically they may have been viewed. But this is by no means an absolute solution. Historical quilts have an exhibition history of their own and one that is nuanced. Even those originally intended for a bed were often not intended to be slept under. As the family story goes, for this quilt on this bed, the maker was appalled that her husband had invited a guest to stay overnight but failed to take the quilt off the bed beforehand. <laughs> Through their long histories, historical quilts were displayed not only on beds but on tables and pianos, taken out of the home on special occasions, pinned up at fairs, thrown over pews, held up to the light and inspected by hand. One final criticism of the 1971 Whitney exhibition was that the presentation of quilters, uh, quilters were presented as anonymous women, which denied the complexity surrounding their production. At the basic level of a collection database entry or an exhibition label, the attribution of a quilt is one of the trickiest curatorial exercises. As the intro panel for the Textile Museum exhibition stated, most of these quilts are orphans, their makers unknown, their ancestry obscure. And as Sue Pritchard has written, 
Many quilts are passed down through the generations, undocumented, although some are accompanied by oral histories and personal narratives over the years, names and dates become confused and stories are embellished. To underline the difficulty of pinning down a quilt for collection or, or exhibition, I will end this talk by looking at a specific quilt from the Heritage Quilt Collection. Sorry, it's a bit bleached out, this photo. While the Agnes Etherington Art Center's Collecting Stories exhibition was up, I received a wonderfully detailed letter from a local historian. Ever since Ruth Com McKendry, who's well known for her, her publications on Canadian quilts, ever since she had donated this friendship signature chimney sweep quilt in 1984, it had been documented as from the Winchester, Ontario area. Keith Sly, with the assistance of librarian Susan Warren, however, traced the names written on the quilt blocks to women living in the late 19th century in the Elgin Forfar area, over 100 kilometers west of Winchester. As with many signature quilts, this one would have had a commemorative function, but what that occasion would have been is unclear. On one square is written, I'll tell you what that says. <laughs> Mrs. Samuel Poole, my mother's possessive, suggesting perhaps the quilt was initiated by and or made for her, or perhaps just the one square was made by Mrs. Poole and incorporated into the rest of the quilt after her death in 1885 by one of her daughters who na whose names also appear on this quilt. Near the close of collecting stories, another friendship signature chimney sweep quilt was donated to the collection. This quilt included 81 names, both men and women, written in ink by the same hand. One square clearly states, Parthena Sweet, her quilt. On another is Parthena Sweet's married name, Parthena Lake, suggesting that this quilt was perhaps made to commemorate her marriage but who, again, exactly initiated and participated in its making is not entirely clear. Both quilts belong to families that lived in Leeds County, not far from each other. Together, they raised the issue of regionally shared patterns and intertwining lives, and how authorship of quilts can often become a narrative without ever finding a definitive author. As Deborah Halbert has discovered in analyzing issues of copyright and quilts, the collaborative nature of quilting defies the presumption of an isolated and original author. The final product can be the result of the work of many. How does one capture this in an exhibition label with a 150 word limit? <laughs> and at the same time account for the diverse and rich contexts from which objects arise. Critical analyses of quilt exhibitions do not take into account the practical exigencies of exhibition development, such as available research, time, space, objects, funding, personnel, and that's without even mentioning the context of programming that goes with every exhibition. Of course, <clears throat> in general, these are not what we want to be obvious to the public, but they certainly impact curatorial intentionality. As the exhibition examples that I showed you attest, no one exhibition can do it all. It is having a number of quilt exhibitions before the public, as witnessed in 2010-2011, that accomplishes plurality. Thank you. <laughs>